right, we're going to go ahead and get started. We certainly don't want to rush the great event that we just had, so I apologize if everyone feels a little rushed, but we do want to make sure that Dwayne gets his time. What he's about to talk about is very important to the future of Westgate, so we want to make sure we give him some time. So I want to welcome you all to Purdue at Westgate's first Tuesday event, or some of you may have known this as News Before Brews. We actually started this in 2017, and we have been doing it ever since. So we, we enjoy it. We have great connections here. We have great people that come. We build relationships. So this is designed as an opportunity for industry, academia, and government innovation to converge, share knowledge, develop networks, and discover opportunities. Today I'm pleased to announce Dwayne Embry. He is the campus side lead and program manager for Draper Labs within the Tech Park. If you have been around this area for a while, you definitely either know him or you know of him. He has been here for a while, and I'm sure he can explain more, but he was the previous technical director at NSWC Crane, and then went on to be asked by Indiana Governor Mike Pence to establish and serve as executive director of the Indiana Office of Defense Development. He has served 35 years as a U.S. Navy civilian, where he helped lead the transformation of NSWC Crane from a naval maintenance and test depot to a national recognized DOD R&D laboratory, engineering and innovation center. One last side note of Duane is that he was appointed the distinguished honor of a Sagamore of the Wabash Award by then Indiana Governor, my, Governor Mitch Daniels. Enough said about what he's done in the past. We want to know what he and Draper Labs is planning for the future of NSWC Crane and Westgate at Crane Technology Park. Dwayne? Thank you, uh, Samantha. She, what she didn't tell you, she's been after me for four years to come do this thing, and I've been putting her off because I didn't think I had anything to say. And then I finally decided, hey, I'm going to do it. So I still may not have much to say, but here we go. I really appreciate you guys being here today. This is important. And you know, as a Purdue grad, I, who would have thought, just kind of like a rock concert, right? I had, I had the setup band come in and, and make their announcement before my big show. How, how, many, how many Purdue grads get to do that? That's amazing. So thank you. Okay, here's the deal. We're going to do a short history of Draper Labs, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing here, where we're going, and then there's going to be a quiz. Okay? So here are the questions that you need to look for in the briefing. You need to, at the conclusion of this, be able to describe Draper's historic role in our nation's defense and space endeavors. You need to define Draper's four lines of business. You need to describe some distinguishing aspects of Draper that make us special. Everybody's special, but these are our special things. And then you, the, the last question is, you need to write an essay on description of Draper at Westgate. I did not agree with that. Okay? Not and if the class can collectively pass the exam, then we, then we get to go partake. How's that? All right. Now, I'm going to warn you, I'm not very IT savvy, so who knows where this thing's going to go. Um, I got to say, as I was putting this, this is Draper's 50th anniversary as uh, an independent, not-for-profit research corporation. Might be on the quiz. Um, prior to that, really in 1922, a guy named Charles Stark Draper came to MIT. He came from Stanford, 
and he was on his way to Harvard, but he stopped at MIT and he stayed. And, and that really changed the course of, of a lot of what we do in our nation today. His, his big interest was in guidance and navigation. And so with MIT lab, which is where he, he worked, he was given a laboratory and he started uh, his initial work on this in the 1940 time frame. They developed the first gyros, the first accelerometers, that all went together to form what is called inertial navigation. And so all that means is you can navigate and find your way and refind your way without referencing to landmarks, which is really important um, in flight. Between this time, 1947 and 1957, MIT lab was doing a lot of work for the Air Force, a little bit of work for the Navy in developing the guidance systems for ballistic missiles built on this technology. In 1957, the Navy issued a sole source contract to the MIT lab to design this inertial guidance system for the Polaris missile, which began the long-standing relationship between what is now Draper Lab and the Navy and the Strategic Program Office. At about this same time, at a place called, that is now called NSWC Crane, this same program office came to begin testing separation cords to separate stages and missiles and to uh, ultimately begin testing these things called microelectronics, which were discrete devices um, Crane got involved in testing those. We still, to this day, have that partnership. And things we've talked about today, things we're going to talk about, uh, play into why we are here today. And I, I don't know about you, but it struck me that the Navy led a contract in 1957 to design this missile. <laughs> and in 1960, three years later, that missile was fired from a submarine. I don't think we could get the safety assessment done in three years. I don't even know if we could get the funding <laughs> in three years. But it struck me that at this time and for about two decades, the amazing stuff that the people of this country did to position ourselves both in defense and in space. I mean, it just struck me. So, 1960. 1961, President Kennedy decides we're going to the moon. Draper received the first contract awarded by NASA for this program which was for the guidance, navigation, and control system. Look for themes in my brief, which will help you when the quiz comes, okay? 
So you've seen Air Force, Navy, ballistic missiles. You've seen NASA. And a common theme might be guidance and navigation. This was cool because this was, uh, this was a telegram that the then senator uh, sent, sent out. Okay, 1962. 1960, the first missile was fired from a submarine. Two years later, it's in the fleet, and we're using them. I, I'm, I'm struck by the speed that this nation executed. Nineteen sixty three. Air Force finally gets theirs to work. First flight of the Minuteman two. Again with a Draper guidance system on it. Nineteen sixty eight. The Apollo eight crew orbited the moon and came back using a Draper guidance navigation system. 1969, we're on the moon. If I remember right, Purdue had some involvement in that. And, and again, think about the timeline, right? From the time the president said, we're going to the moon, to the time that we're there. I, I just, it gives me goosebumps, folks. 1970, space shuttle. So Draper had responsibility for design uh, of the space shuttle's on-flight orbit control system and the backup software. And at that same year, Apollo 13 uh, had their problem, reported back to Houston, we have a problem. And they were able to use, uh, <laughs> this is, this is going to get redundant, but they were able to use Draper software on a lunar excursion model. You remember this from the movie, probably. Uh, and they made their way back. Just think about this. From during those decades, look at what was going on in this country from a standpoint of development of these capabilities. And you know, they were using chalkboards for the most part. So that's a, that's, a, that's a deal. Maybe the reason they got so fast, they didn't have to get IT certification approval, you think? <laughs> Every other month, boom, 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 with a three month delay in between. All right, 1971, <clears throat> the Poseidon uh, missile, was deployed, and at the, that same year, uh, Draper was given overall design and development responsibility for the Trident One missile that would would now use the Star Tracker to initially position itself. 1973. Um, and this had started a few years back, but um, Draper uh, spun off of MIT and established itself as an independent, not-for-profit corporation, the Charles Stark Draper Lab. 
One of, the, one of our questions on the quiz was describe one of the unique characteristics, distinct characteristics of Draper that enables us to do our job. 1979, we had the Mark V guidance system deployed on a, um, a Trident I on the C-4 missile. 1981, first launch of the space shuttle. And that was, what, nine years, 11 years in development there? So that's still pretty quick. 1987. I put this in here because you just never know where something's going to take you. But this was um, the development of a micro-mechanical system. We know those as MIMS today. Um, a solid-state gyro, if you will, that Draper developed. Now, this particular piece of technology, MIMS technology, you're going to see show up later in a whole different area, totally different area of, of our business. But think about sensors is really what we're talking about here. 1990, the Navy deployed the Trident II. And, and I put this um, yellow undersea device here. This was, uh, and Draper still has a lot of this business, um, autonomous undersea vehicles. So this was a test bed we developed for the Navy. Um, and, and we're still doing that. A lot of what we do is develop the technology, proof it out, um, not hold on to the IP, but pr provide for government licensing of the IP government purpose rights. Um, and, and so this is an example of that. 2016, uh, Trident II missile. And Draper is the prime contractor for design, development, production, and sustainment for this guidance system. That was a real challenge for a laboratory. <laughs> Got it figured out, but uh, that was a real challenge. And again, through this time, the Navy has had a sole source relationship with Draper on the guidance system um, to, uh, to develop and maintain. I'm going to speed up here a little bit. Um, 2017, the Draper guidance system enabled a hypersonic glide body uh, to target its initial flight, hit its initial uh, flight target, uh, to demonstrate hypersonic long-range precision strike for the first time. 2019 and 2021, these are both examples of Draper's bioscience um, business line. And you wonder, how in the world did we get into this? Well, the answer is MIMS. So the ability to insert these devices to measure fluid flow, to measure and sense things they need to sense for the artificial organs and, and for some of the testing that they do were the key enabling technology for this. So you remember previously it was for guidance and now it's used in, in, in bio. And really we're refocusing a lot of that into defense bio. So whether it's detection, sensing, uh, any kind of biohazards that, that uh, the nation may incur, in, but it's really defense focused. So Draper today, 
today. Draper is an independent, not-for-profit corporation. We have a mission of applied research and development, technology transition, uh, and advanced technical education. So as part of our not-for-profit status, uh, we have a, a huge focus on education. We have a thing called the Draper Scholars Program now, it used to be Draper Fellows, with a huge number of those. I think we're doing a huge number of those over time, and we introduce 50 new candidates each year. So we have had three at Purdue, uh, and we will be um, we'll be doing more. And I hope that as as I use capabilities in in cyber and microelectronics, uh, maybe even radiation, uh, grow that we can we can have have some there as well. Four business areas. Strategic systems, electronic systems, space systems, and biotechnology, or as we call it, just defense bio. Business space, about 660 million in, in FY22, about 1,900 employees, not giant, not huge, um, nine campuses. Pay attention to the red dots, um, and they're almost in the right spots. But the uh, the headquarters is in Cambridge, Mass, right next door to MIT. Uh, Cape Canaveral. Uh, we have a wonderful site there, where submarines can come in. We take and repair and analyze the the guidance systems there. We also have a uh, flight line and a pod on an F-16 where we fly uh, the new guidance designs and uh, evaluate those prior to, uh, to missile implementation. Houston, of course, is focused on our NASA support. Huntsville is, is focused on missile defense and some other things. Uh, Pittsfield is... Um, is where we do a lot of our uh, production work. The rest in Virginia uh, office uh, supports some DC-based customers, but it primarily supports a lot of uh, classified special application customers in the Northern Virginia area. And the St. Petersburg is a microelectronics center uh, supporting uh, a lot of um, some special applications, but, but also a lot of anti-tamper, a lot of uh, technology protection for microelectronics applications. And then the DC Navy Yard is in very specifically in support of the SP customer. And, and the newest one is, is the Odin, Indiana office. So that's, um, that's, uh, that's who we are and where we, where we reside. We like, to, we like to say that we sit at the intersection of government, industry, and academia. That is, from a standpoint of transitioning that technology, trying to make it real. And then, for the most part, working with industry to get it um, into production. Except when SP tells us they want us to do the production, and we salute smartly and do what SP says. And, and then we work very closely with universities, other not-for-profits, and the whole FFRDC range of APLs, Sandia, um, and, and a good note, um, I probably shouldn't say this since it's being recorded. Um, there is a lot more attention being, 
being paid now to universities outside of Cambridge, Massachusetts than there has been in the past. And uh, in fact, I heard it said in my presence that Purdue was the MIT of the Midwest, which I promptly said, or MIT is the Purdue of the East Coast. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's a special arrangement there. And, and um, it's very important uh, as a not-for-profit, and it's also very important for the quiz. I've got a little video I want to show of, of where we're going. At Draper, we saw humanity's greatest challenges as innovators, disruptors, scientists, and engineers. We develop technology and solutions to solve the next life critical mission. With nine years as precision problem solver, we're building on our legacy to protect our customers and the nation. Leveraging our multidisciplinary approach, we drive innovation across four areas to advance security, provide extreme reliability, and high precision accuracy. We improve public health and safety and prevent, detect, and respond to emerging biological issues for our national and economic security. We deploy advanced technology for precision sensing, guidance, navigation, and control hardening instrumentation and mission autonomy. And we pioneer novel technologies that enhance mission effectiveness in an increasingly complex world. Draper is transforming and shaping the future one bold step at a time, going beyond boundaries of planets and the depths of the ocean to serve our nation's interests. It's part of our DNA. It's what drives us. It's what defines us. Draper next, unlimited possibilities. Okay, so why Draper at Westgate? You really ought to be able to answer this, but, I, but I'll go ahead. We have two major thrusts coming together at Westgate, both critically important to the nation. So in the, in the nuclear modernization side, the development, tests, and sustainment of LE2 microelectronics for the hostile environment. And by hostile, we're talking not only the traditional radiation environment, but now a cyber environment, an EW attack environment, and a cradle-to-grave supply chain protection and security. Um, we have been and will continue to be working hand-in-hand -hand with Crane on this, and that's going to grow. The second piece is CHIPS Act funding, and, and I say CHIPS Act to include um, both the CHIPS Act money that DOD has received, building on what DOD was already doing through the Trusted and Assured Microelectronics Program led by Crane. And so Crane is leading a huge piece of the uh, CHIPS Act funding on the DOD side. Uh, Matt Kay, who was here, instrumental in all of that. Uh, Doug Crow here with NSTXL and those guys and the work they're doing. Um, it was time for Draper to be at Westgate. So we are working closely um, with a lot of the partnering companies, universities, and Crane that were mentioned here today and that we're all aware of uh, in support of two of Draper's primary business lines, that being strategic systems and, uh, and electronic systems. Today, there's the office. We st <laughs> this was a fun adventure. We stood up the office in the fall of 2019, and then <laughs> we had COVID. 
we were we were we were all set to begin hiring and staffing up in 19 um, and then COVID. we had some internal uh, turbulence within draper itself and so it was not until uh, really mid 22 that we said okay it's time let's go let's get staffed up and uh, and let's get moving again across three areas that you heard that you heard in the previous uh, event microelectronics nuclear modernization hypersonics we're currently staffed at 12 engineers uh, we expect growth over the next year and increasingly over the the following years in strategics and electronic systems business lines. So uh, the focus, systems engineering and test, electronics design and test, packaging and radiation effects. That's it. Questions before the quiz. Anybody have any questions before the quiz? Seriously, you got any questions? Doug. <laughs> Honestly, um, SP is the, they're dominant. Uh, we, Space, space is a lot different than space used to be. Um, and we are on the team, we're on the Artemis team, um, going to the moon and the Mars mission. We're on the team, our guidance system is there. Um, uh, you know, what's gonna happen in satellites and commercial space and all of that, I don't know. Um, uh, I just don't know. So. We really, if, if you really look at it, the, the strategic systems work is the core of what we do. It sustains the company. It sustains the innovation. And we like to talk about it as a springboard, if you will, uh, technologies and ideas and innovation that come out of what we do on Trident ends up in a lot of places across the company. So that's, that's, that's the way that works. And, I, you know, space is a piece of the business. It's not huge at this point, but it is a critical piece of the business. How about others? Okay, yes. Yeah, so I will tell you, we had, we had a real challenge in hiring. And for companies, as we, as we now, I'm, now I'm putting on my regional hat, as we try to, to grow more companies and we try to hire more people, the East Coast, West Coast companies are not really they don't understand this area. They don't really know how to hire. And I've, I've talked to, to, to Crane HR staff folks about how could we maybe do some of that together. Um, so it's a challenge. We finally, we finally cracked the nut, but boy, it was a chore. Um, and, and I think we know how to do it now, but it will be a chore for companies as they try to come in. How about others? Yeah. It'll be it'll be engineers, scientists, physicists. We're a we're a deep technical organization. I'm the dumbest guy at Draper, 
and I don't know, you know, it's not a not a new place for me, but <laughs> but, but I am the dumbest guy at Draper. John. Uh, you know, I, I could easily see us doubling. I, I, I could see that. I don't know about it. I'll just tell you, a lot of it's going to depend on how all of these um, CHIPS Act funding shakes out. And um, I don't know yet. We don't know. So, uh, but I can, I would expect we could double over the next year or two. Yeah, pretty easily. Right now, it's office space. Uh, we may. We may. Um, I think we're going to be working very closely with Crane. Here's the problem. The business we're in uh, is uh, classification intense. And uh, we will be doing classified work in the facilities. But, you know, you throw labs on top of that, it's challenging. Now, we're, we're partnered with some of the companies that are building facilities here. We may end up in one of those. Again, I just don't know because a lot of things have to align and a lot of things have to happen. Um, but we are fully prepared to grow out of the building we're in. Uh, and that's another reason why I'm kind of holding off on, on some of the stuff. We will probably have some lab space. Yes. I think the biggest challenge was for a folks, a company who has traditionally hired in the Northeast to try to try to get the recruiters, to try to get the consultants, to try to get that machine to operate here. Uh, that really was the biggest challenge. Yeah, we broke it. I mean, we 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 did it, but was not with not without you know me making a few trips to Cambridge and pounding on desk um, which is you know again not something I haven't done in the past yes Kurt yeah I've heard that, yes. <laughs> and I'm wondering, particularly with uh, the university that has a school of medicine, yep. is there a segment uh, that might have? I, I think so, too. We've had some initial discussions, but, you know, just the pace of events over the last several months has prevented us from really mapping that out. But I think it's time. Yep, I think it's time. Yeah. Yes, sir. That's our plan. What do you see in the future as the nexus challenge and then the next one? Remember, this answer is coming from the dumbest guy, Draper. I think the big challenge is, is, is how do we sift through everything that's out there? You know, I mean, look at, look at artificial intelligence right now. If you looked at, if you looked at the, the venture investors, right, they were all in going, we're going to make this thing go, and now everybody's going, whoa, what do we have here? So I think really methodically applying the discipline to understand um, ha 
how do how do we how do we do innovation and how do we keep it open so the nation can take advantage of it right that that's a that's a challenge uh, the technical stuff we have a lot of technical people who know how to do that um, but I think I think those are those are some of the things that are that we're going to have to sort through yeah from the dumbest guy Draper any other you guys are stalling because you don't want to take the quiz <laughs> yes yeah yeah so um, sometimes we um, contract directly to them right uh, sometimes we're a subcontractor in the case of the Air Force we're a subcontractor to the prime in the case of crane for example and some other government activities we are both funded by the sponsor SP and and so uh, we have we have some work directly funded by crane in microelectronics development um, and technology protection uh, through the the uh, OSD trusted and assured program most of the relationship with crane is direct funding from the Navy customer which they fund us and they fund crane and we partner so and then we have some collaborative efforts with some of the um, FFRDC's like the uh, you know the applied physics lab um, Sandia so it, it just varies all right anything else okay it's quiz time quiz time okay what is Draper's historic role in the nation's defense and space business toss-up question guidance and navigation for space both aerospace for for missiles and rocket ships right and moon landers what are Draper's four business lines don't be shy now biotech strategic systems electronic systems and space describe some distinctions that Draper has that put us at the intersection of academia industry and not-for-profits labs Kirk independent not-for-profit corporation yes describe and since we're running out of time I won't make you do the essay we'll just talk about it describe Draper at Westgate why are we here where are we going okay yep yep what's our current staffing level well what are we going to grow to who knows <laughs> as one of my grandkids favorite characters would say to infinity and beyond all right hey thank you been a great audience hopefully you know a little bit about why we're here and what we're doing and a little bit about our history. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dwayne. Oops. Thank you all for coming. I also want to let you know that the recording and the slides will be sent to anybody that's RSVP'd. If you haven't RSVP'd, make sure that you get with our marketing communications manager, Morgan Tavis, and get put on our distribution list because you don't want to miss any of the other events that we have here and and just in case 
Um, I took all of that information off of our direct um, released material. So I tried not to deviate much, at least on the slides, from, from that. So it is generally um, CUI and specifically all proprietary, just, just so you know. All right, thank you. So yeah, get, get with Morgan or even myself if you want to be added to the distribution list. A couple of events that we are going to have in the near future. Next first Tuesday, so you know we do this every first Tuesday, we're actually having Ashley Bronner. She is actually from Lidos slash Dynetics. I think it's formerly Dynetics or they're moving from Dynetics in the hypersonics area. So she's going to be here speaking on what they're doing and maybe their potential presence here uh, within the tech park or at NSWC Crane at some point. So also tomorrow, we are having a lunch and learn here. Tom Weiniger, who is back there in the black shirt, if you don't know him, Weiniger Construction, Westcott Properties. For the first time, there's housing developed here in the Tech Park. It is right down the road in Scotland, Indiana. He's done a fantastic job of putting multiple units up there. Several other people have actually started to lease their rent there. Uh, some of the other microelectronics companies that are coming in here, they have had presents that are, that are going there. So he is having a lunch and learn tomorrow with a bank that specializes in first time home buying. So if you're interested in that, 11 to one, come here, we'll, we'll make sure that you get to the right room and you'll get a voucher to go to the food truck and get some lunch. So we wanna invite you to do that. Uh, another first two, no, excuse me, another event that we will be having, a future event, October 24th, we haven't officially announced it yet, but we're going to announce it right now. We're going to have a microelectronics day here. If you've been here in the past for some of the days that we've done, we've done cybersecurity day, autonomous day. So we get 150 to 200 people here, vendors, panels, speakers. So we're going to have a microelectronics day because we have to. There's no doubt that this is where it's happening. So we have to do that. October 24th, you'll get to save the date for that. Um, I got one more thing. This is for you. So in the midst of our struggling to hire, Samantha was heroic in getting our jobs up on, up on your site, which I know a lot of people went to. So somebody asked that question. These guys did a great job helping us get that word out in this circle. So thank you. That was, that was actually Morgan and a former person here put a job board together, which is phenomenal. So, But we did have weekly calls with Draper. Uh, they wanted to understand the places down here to potentially market to, what is the language that's being used down here. Eventually, they, it led to retooling their descriptions, their job descriptions. They were looking for a lot of specialty type that they realized they could train for, so they, they changed their retooling a little bit, so that helped out a lot as well. So. Uh, just one last thing, I uh, just want to make sure that everyone knows you have been here before, if some of you have been here before, this is obviously a growing area, growing region, and you have just witnessed another opportunity that is happening within the tech park. I've seen him for four years now and didn't have any idea what he was doing over there, so he's led me to believe that he has been doing something over there. So, so I appreciate him coming here. Thank you all for coming.